My name is Bryce Matthews, and this is the Deep and Lonely Podcast presented to you by Houndsman XP. During this podcast, we will dive deep into what makes the ultimate, top level, and unmatched extreme competition coon hunter. We will hear stories of old, tales of today, and we will dive deep into what separates the men from the boys. The stories will be raw, the truth will be told, and the camaraderie will be second to none. Pull up your chaps. It's about to get deep. All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of the Deep and Lonely Podcast presented to you by Houndsman XP. It is a wonderful October evening, and I've got Mr. Caleb Griffin joining me today. Guys, this is going to be a great podcast. Mr. Caleb here, he has been on a roll this year in 2023, and we are here to bring you all the information on him and his dog, keep you up to date on what's been going on with them and the competition coonhound world, and just get to know them a little bit better. So, Caleb... How are you today, brother? Dude, I'm doing good, man. How about yourself? Buddy, I can't complain. I mean, it's a wonderful Wednesday evening. It's a little warm here for October. I mean, I wish it was oh, a little... Oh, man, yeah, today, today was supposed to be the high for this week. It's been miserable. Yeah, I mean, I'm ready to break out, you know, the briarproof sweatshirt and leaves fall off and getting into that coon hunting weather. Bro, that's the same thing. I cooked a pot of chili last night. I was like, ooh, I got me some deer and bear chili. It's cool time. And I was like 80, 83, 84 degrees today. I'm like, this is not working. Yeah. <laughs> Bear chili, one of my favorite things in the world. Uh, Absolutely. I go down there to Virginia and hunt with Heath Hyatt every year and usually bring oh, me back. Okay. Yeah, usually bring me back a few packs of bear meat there. Man, right. chili, tacos, and anything. I'm a big fan of the bear meat. I love it. I love, a lot of people's like, that's the, they don't know how it's cooked or they're not cooking it right. Bear is one of the best meats and like, for the people that don't know it, if you take render the bear fat down into a bear lard and make biscuits with it, absolute best biscuits you'll ever eat in your life. So that's one thing that I want to do this year is I want to bring some of that fat back to render it down because the last couple of years I've just brought the meat home. But I've been right. I've been listening to the Bear Grease podcast with Clay Newcomb right. a lot. One of a great podcast, no affiliation here, but we're gonna give him a plug. If you guys need another podcast to listen to, check it out. It's fantastic. Anyways, back to this point. I want to render down some fat and try and use it to cook right. because I haven't done that yet. Yeah. Everybody says it's good. Amazing. Amazing. And it's also, you can use it to keep your boots waterproof. Yeah. It, it, it's just, it's good for everything. And just make sure you get the white fat. No meat in the fat. <laughs> okay. So are you harvesting these bears down where you're at or how are you going about acquiring yep. this? I used to bear hunt religiously before I got into like really competition coon hunting or yeah. coon hunting and everything like that. And I hunted from like Canada to, to Florida. Oh. I hunted religiously. And so, but right now we have a one week dog season in South Carolina up here in the mountains where I live at. Yeah. And they give us, well, they give us one week to still hunt them and then one week for dog season. And it's more or less like a, a family event. Like I've got the guys I bear hunted with. And we have a cabin up in the mountain, and like we got guys from North Carolina and Tennessee, then they all come down. It's it's a family get together for a week. We all get together, stay at the camp, rough it, and just hunt for a week. And so, so why I do step. they limit you to a week? Is that just the thing South Carolina has done for a long time? Did you guys have a, a smaller yeah. population? Why are you limited to a week? Well, we used to have a small population of just bears coming from Georgia and North Carolina passing through. Right. But in the past probably ten years, I mean they have. They've really, really, really increased the numbers. And so we've developed a resident bear population. And now, you know, we got a buku of them around here. It's just there's not that much land to hunt as far as the game management land in, inside. Because you're right there where I live at. I'm right there on the northeast or, yeah, northeastern Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina line. So I border both states. I can be in both states within 30 minutes each way. So, gotcha. you know, yeah. Man, so let's talk kinda, about bears. I mean, this is a little off topic for Deep and Lonely, but I'm I'm here for it. Let's talk about that bear you shared on your Facebook today. That's a mammoth for around here, dude. I killed him when I, I used to be a Marine, so I was stationed out of Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. And um, I used to bear hunt around the, the sound up through there. And, you know, there's huge bear on the coast of North Carolina. And I'd killed a big one years ago out there on the coast. But for a mountain bear, <laughs> that was a monster. I remember, I think, like, 
10 or 11 years ago, we had a guy killed that hunts with us, and we killed one that was 588 pounds up here. And it was like a, a black Volkswagen. <laughs> and I can only imagine what you put another 100 pounds on one, which is what that bear was. Yeah, what was it, like 628 or something like that? 672. 672. Oh, my God. I think that's what it was. Six. I think it was, yeah, I think it was like 6. It might have been something less, but it was somewhere around there. It was huge. I mean, I just was happened to be scrolling through there this afternoon, and I saw that picture, and I was like, oh, my. Like, that there is a beast. Well, that's just what I was looking at. I was showing somebody. I was like, look at the hair on this bear's feet. It's like he's got slippers on. That's how long his hair is. <laughs> I know that's the first thing that stuck out to me, too, is I was like, God bless it. I ain't never seen the hairy feet like that. <laughs> right. But, all right, man. So, obviously, you know, we've told the listeners, you're from South Carolina. You're into bear hunting. Take us back to the beginning. Let's start at the very beginning of Caleb Griffin. What got you into dogs? What got you into bear hunting? What got you into competition I coon hunting? Let's hear it. Dude, I've hunt, I've started hunting. I've hunted with dogs my whole life. Um, my dad always had coon dogs. My grandpa, my all my family members. I you know it, it was rub, rabbit hunting, or running bear dogs, hog dogs. Uh, I used to run coon dogs all the time. Just I had I competition hunted back then, but what I used to think was coon dogs. You know, it was like in the late nineties, early two thousands, and stuff like that. So it was bucket bumping. And so it was like a shotgun race to call your dog struck tree, <laughs> run down through there. They're all getting treated together. You know, uh, you could take a me too dog and beat anybody. <laughs> so that was what I cut my teeth in as far as competition hunting. And I never really excelled much past the, the level of, you know, $25 hunts. That's it. Yeah. Well, you just coined a new phrase for me, bucket bumping. That just made my day. We could end the podcast right here and it'd go five star rating reviews. Bucket bucket. That was good. I hate bucket bucket. I hate that crap. <laughs> <laughs> I hate them. All right. So that's what you got into when you were younger. Like, okay, tell us about your bear hunting. Would that come before the competition coon hunting? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Most definitely. Most definitely. Um, I got into, when I was still in the military, I would, what got into bear hunting and I'd bear hunting with them. The, I call it my mountain family. <laughs> the guys that live around here that have the have always had a bear party. I joined a bear party, and I was hunting with them that year. And it was my first year, and I'll never forget. Like we were, you know, you're in no man's land in the mountains, and I get in there, and you, there's something about hearing thirty something dolls, twenty something dolls treed off in a big holler, and just that roar coming out of there. And I got in there, and I had killed my first bear. I think it was like three hundred and thirty eight pounds, three hundred forty eight pounds, something like that. And that just, that lit a fire under me. And then from there, I progressed into getting my own bear dogs. And I had four of them. And um, I used to hunt a lot and a lot and a lot. And it just, bear hunting is, a, it was great. And I enjoyed it. And I did it for a long time. But it's a group effort. And whereas when I hunt, I hunt, this is going to sound bad. You may have to edit this. I hunt like a meth head steals copper. Like I hunt every <laughs> night. When I, you know, when I get a dick, when I get addicted to it, I, I want to do it. You can't, you can't bear hunt with, you know, without a group of people. Right. It's hard. And so that kind of, that's what led me to kind of coon hunt, so to speak, and everything. You're really, really into competition hunt. Right. Yeah. So speaking of hunting like a meth head steals copper, I believe <laughs> that I. I think it was this year's uh, coverage when we're going to get into this later, but I think you said something that you hunted 362 nights out of a year one time. That first 362 nights, that first year I had preacher. The next year I hunted 360 nights. Well, so rain, slit, we, I want to know how do you do that? Like, what do you do for a living that allowed you to hunt like that? Or are you just crazy? I retire. No, I retired out of the Marine Corps. I did 10 years and then contracted for another year. And then that gave me, I had five combat deployments twice, direct three times to Afghanistan. So my overseas time superseded my dwell time and I ended up getting a full pension out of it. And um, so I took some couple of, and after I went back and got out and I went back to Clemson and finished my degree, I was like, well, I'm going to take a couple of years off, a few years off and just kind of a couple of years and just kind of do my own thing, get caught up on my hunting. Cause the whole time I was in Clemson, I couldn't really hunt and, you know, because I was going to school, couldn't hunt like I wanted to. And about that same time, I got preacher. And during that time, I was duck hunting. And I have a boy can spaniel. It's like my retriever dog. And I trained him. And so I was really into working those types of field trials and everything. Well, then I got preacher. And um, uh, 
he 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 hit a spark with me that first night, and I and like to, almost drove me crazy. And so, he and I went to grind in that first year, and I mean, we hunted through a tornado. <laughs> we we left my truck parked in the middle of the road when a tornado was coming, and he and I we climbed in a culvert, hid in the culvert while the tornado. Uh, no, that's no bullshit. I mean, that's that's honest to God. We yeah. did. And um, I don't know, man. It's just when you get a young dog that's under a year old. Is consistently treating you four to five to six coons a night on game management land, and you're pushing him, and he's got that much drive and potential. You, it's hard, it's hard to leave him sitting in the kennel. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, I, I knew, like, going back to that, I knew what my dog was off of. He was off of a dog named Bad Habit Sambo. Okay. And Sambo was a dog that changed my whole perspective, perspective of what a coon dog was. Sambo came along. And my buddy Wes Hamby had first bought him, and this was right before he won Super Stakes with him. And uh, what I had thought was a coon dog was not a coon dog. And um, we went hunting with Sambo up here on the mountain, and uh, Sambo treated coons where there shouldn't have been coons. I mean, like pop, popped them up like squirrels. Like, and I watched that, and, and I was sitting there in awe one night as I shot four coons out to a place that I hadn't seen a coon in twenty years. And. Um, that that dog seeing that dog work and how he really worked and recut and everything like that, I I really liked it, and I, I was like, and I, and I you know I started then I started doing all my research. Well, then I got preacher and I started training him, and I'll never forget I, the first competition hunt I ever went to with him. I, I took him up to the CHKC World Hunt in Paris, Tennessee. First time he'd ever been with dogs, because his first year and a half, I never hunted with him with another dog till he was almost two years old. He just really? by himself in the woods. Yeah grinding night after night after night and um i took him to the chkc world hunt and everybody was like why are you doing that why are you doing that? i said because i need to figure out what the standard i need to train him to you know i need to see how these guys are doing and what they do in the tempo of a good competition hunt and i mean i got my gut speed out i'm not gonna lie about it. i drew travis tate was hunting the trigger man dog that jake moore eventually hunted um michael moody was hunting uh, moby jr there was a guy from Texas who was hunting. I, I drew, I drew a, a, I drew some coon dogs, but I learned the standard as to what they were using to to win and how their dogs was working. So I took that out. And I went to work for another six, seven months, and then I started putting him in competition hunts and winning. Yeah. So tell me about that. So do you did you have any issues if you sold him out for that long? Did you have any issues? A lot of issues. Whenever you put him in with dogs, did it blow his mind? A, yes most definitely it was horrible it was horrible we had to do a lot of shock therapy on him shoulder rubbing like turning him loose with male dolls strange male dolls he didn't know it go out through there just arr, shoulder rubbing there was a lot of issues that i will and that's a mistake that i'll never make again <laughs> yeah so i've got a young pup right now i think she's 16 months old and that's one thing that i'm working on is is i'm trying to go maybe and i haven't calculated it but you know two-thirds one-third two-thirds by herself and um, one third with other dogs because I don't right. want to cause that. I don't want I don't want her to be just so mind blown. But she does need to learn to be, you know, independent. Right. But you don't get to hunt by yourself right. in and these that, competitions. I, it's, I almost I almost ruined him kind of in a way by hunting him too much by himself. If that's you know, because it was it got to the point why I, this dog would tree coon by itself. And it was crazy, but you take him on a cast of dogs and he was like, it blowed his mind. Like he would just be doing some stupid stuff. And right. just, I mean, that one time I had the 15 put on me in a hunt cause he went for a not hunting. And I'm like, this dog's never not hunted in a day in his life. And then he got off from there and, um, I went to work and then I ended up working with a lot of my buddies that live around this local area. They competition hunting. We'd all get together like a few nights a week and be like, Hey, Bring your dog, get your TT fifteens. Let's get, let's do some work. You know, right. let's do some training. <laughs> yeah. So, so how long did it take you to get him out of that funk? I mean, if if he about was programmed, months. you know, to hunt by himself, how long did it take you to get out of that? About about six months. Six months of really hard, really working, trying to end everything on a good note, but really working. In six months, I had him. I could take him and win. And once that dog figured out how to win, it's like it hadn't stopped and that's what i was telling everybody that's crazy it's hunting with him i'm like you know by itself he's just gonna he's no better than any other dog he's gonna he's gonna go out there and trick him and that's 
you know, you're going to turn him loose. He's going to go out there and blue ticket for a little while and trail it up and tree it. But, but, but he, take, he, he, he can blue ticket a little bit. I mean, he's got it in his blood. Yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't, I don't, I don't, and I don't mind it to be honest with you sometimes, but there's something about when a dog knows how to win and, and, and you, and you could see it in that dog's face. Like they know, when they're they're competitive, the dog's competitive. He knows how to win. You know, it's that's what it makes me love it so much. Yeah. So so let's go back and touch on that. Tell us a little bit about uh, you know his breeding because he is a, a crossbred by all standards. Right. So right. Let, let's dive into that he, a little bit. He's a three quarter Walker, a quarter blue tick. Like Sambo was a half blue tick, half Walker off of a dog named Eubanks Bad ba- or ha- Bad Bandit, which is off Bad Habit, and a blue tick and. Uh, Forgive me, I'm really unfamiliar with the blue tick side of that. I don't I know am much too. about pedigrees. Of, what's that? I said I am too. Don't worry. I, I'm, I, you know, I don't know much about pedigrees and bloodline. I was out of it for so long. I used to know stuff like that stuff, but um, we crossed him with a full Walker female straight off of Stylus Frankie, and um, that Walker chip that put him made him three quarters Walker, a quarter blue tick, and um, I end up ha- I had two out of that litter. I got one, got Preacher, and then I got his his littermate brother about a year later. And I hunted him for a year, but he got a really bad disease. It was in, in, like an, a, in an intestinal infection. And by the time he got sick and we called it, it was done too late, and he had spread throughout his insides, and he died two weeks later. Yeah. But, yeah, um, yeah it was a real sad. But that dog, uh, that was the loudest dog of any hound I've ever heard in my life. So what made, you, what made you pick Preacher out of that litter? He looked like a big beagle. I did. I mean, he wasn't. I didn't get the pick of the litter. I just seen my buddy at Mark Sandiker, which is he always did a lot of the competition hunting. He and Elliot Shuler owned the dog, and Elliot Shuler's from around Holly Hill, South Carolina. And he was up at Mark's house, and I rode up there one day, and I seen this dog that was real high town, and I was like, "Well, he looks like a big beagle." And I was like, "Well, I'm gonna bring him home with me." And Mark said, "We'll talk to Elliot." Well, I talked to Elliot, and Elliot said, "Yeah, I don't need him right now. He he has said he had a lot of other dogs and whatever." So. I took this little joker that night down here at the lake and um, I turned him loose and he just hits the ground and starts snorting like a beagle trying to hit a track. Like he, and he just takes off hunting. And I had never seen a dog that was as natural. The first time they had ever been turned loose a day in their life, just wanting to run something. I mean, just had this nudge, just, just snorting going through the woods and everything like that. And he yeah. went just straight off this ridge by luck and struck a coon track. And went down there and just started locating and locating and locating. He didn't even know how to treat. Right. And so I grab I grabbed my rifle and my light. And you know, it'd been two a year and a half since I'd been coon hunting. So I was trying to get everything together. I take off running up through there and I shine this. I find a coon and I shoot it out to him. And I'm like, ooh, I got something here. <laughs> and I remember I never I didn't tell Mark or Elliot that story. I took a video of it, but I didn't tell them that whole story. And if I, I wanted, I made sure I paid him and got the papers. <laughs> and then I told Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you don't want no reneging on that one that'd be terrible that's exactly what we would have had to fight over that <laughs> some things you just got to keep in your back pocket that's right that's right all right so you you spent a couple of years working on him sounds like i mean over 700 nights in two yep. years that's just that blows my mind i mean i like to think i hunt hard i don't hunt that hard i promise you i don't he he had, he had a rough couple of years. I mean, no, it wasn't bad. He enjoyed doing. But you, this dog, um, this dog is he's lazy. And I'll be, uh, I say this for first and foremost, he's he's going to do the same thing at the same speed seven nights a week from dark to daylight. The same, he's going to do the same thing, and he's never going to give you any less. Five mile an hour is as max as you're going to get out of him, and that's just how he hunts. You know. Five mile an hour, just the same steady little speed. But, but he's, he's never going to. What? It's worked for him. Oh, it's always. I mean, he's he's always been kind of a loner, dead loner. And it's just, he's always just getting in there and it's always worked for him. And he don't, he don't care if 10 other dogs blow by him. He's going to say, try his own speed. If they go a certain direction, he's going to start kind of veer to the right or veer to the left. And he's going to go his own little route. Yeah. Yeah. So. Let's let's talk about some of this year that you've had with Preacher Man. I mean, you've been on a roll with him. <laughs> you you got him in to the top 100 at the Tournament of Champions, UKC. Right. Walk us through that event. 
Oh, man, that was a good – that was a good run. Um, got through the first 100, and I knew it was going to be a good week up there because I took him out on that first night, and I got 100 strike. And I've never – maybe one other time in my life ever got 100 strike. And I was like, oh, boy, it's going to something special. About that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so I got 100 strike, and I ended up winning that round. And then I came back the next night and went through there again. And that was a little more of a closer round. And I ended up winning that round. And then um, I made it to the head-to-head match, which is the top six. Right. And my buddy Cody Carter that won was, right. with Cookie, he was my judge. And um, I drew an, another dog, a crap, that blue tick dog. And um, my dog looked like an idiot. And I, I, we pulled, it wasn't for the lack of coons. Where we pulled up to hunt at, they were coons fighting in a tree at the top of the hill. And I was like, I've never, and I, you know, you could look through the woods and see coons running around. And I've never in my life, you know, I've hunted the White River every year and I've never seen coons like that, like that was up there at Cody's place. And um, I think it was just so much coon tracks that it blew my dog's mind. He couldn't, he couldn't hit a track without hitting another track. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. So was he the only crossbred that made it up there or was there a couple of you? It was. I started out with a couple, and then I I was the only one that held it on. Yeah. So where did you end up placing this year? I made it to the top six. It was um. It was last cast round, and then we went to a head to head round. It was me and the blue tick, Casey Maggard and um, Casey Stallard, and then Jeff Rickless with Hobo and whoever the the dog was on his cast, and whoever won that that round made it to the final three. Right. So, it was, so pulled, you know, who did you go heads up against? Uh, dog blue tick named Crowder. Okay, and he so he just made it to the finals of the fall super stakes. Super stakes, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've heard he's pretty nice. That's uh Travis Dill, I believe, Hunts Crowder. Right, 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 right. Yep. So right on, man. All right, so you leave you leave the tournament champions, top six. I mean, you've got to be feeling good. I was feeling good. It was a good it, you know, I was like, Well, we you know we did something. <laughs> yeah. Is is that the first was, major event that he's been I, in? No, I made it to the tournament champions the first year they ever had it. Okay. Um, I made it there, and then I made it to the world finals in Dyersburg last year. And so then I made it back up to the tournament champions this past, you know, up there for the top six. And I left there, and I, and that was the first event re- I'd really, you know, progressed that far into in UKC. And so I left there, I was like, heck yeah, you know, this is awesome. Well, the next weekend they had – the Georgia state had a youth hunt next, you know, around here. So my little boy, he's 12. So he handled it, the dog in the youth hunt and he went up winning first place overall in the youth hunt. And that's, that's probably my most memorable hunt I've ever hunted is watching my boy call my dog. Yeah. Or, and, and, you know, do that and everything like that. Like, I don't, I don't, you know, it's great third in the world or whatever else. And, and everything, those are great. But when you see your kid, how happy it lights and makes your kid happy, that's, that, that means everything to me. Yeah, man, I love it. I take yeah. I take my boy out, and you know he's eleven, and he just eats it up, and oh, it, yeah. it kills me right now because he had a really nice dog that he he made her a grand night all on his own, um, you know, right. put, put her wins on her, got her qualified for the uh, tournament champions. I took him down to the zone, and you know he handled his own dog, and and that made that made me happy. You know, it, it like you oh, said, yeah. it, it lights a fire that you don't get hunting for yourself. Um, that's right seeing them do it now it is hard for me i will admit i'm a terrible backup handler i'm a terrible spectator because i want to call that dog the whole time <laughs> well my my we see and my son's he's um he's he's got a big heart and so he wants to make friends with everybody on his cast and that's great now i love the sportsmanship side of it and everything like that i'm a competitor i like to win i'm i'm very competitive and so he'll be sitting there and he'll He'll let his dog tree for five minutes, and he was like, he asked some other kid, like, where's your dog at? Is your dog coming to join my dog? <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, tree dog, you know? <laughs> I'm trying to, like, look for a rock I can throw or something. <laughs> oh, my gosh. See, mine's the opposite. Mine is probably more competitive than me. I'll never forget. Really? We go down there to the tournament champions, the qualifiers. We were in Kentucky, and, uh, gosh, he drew uh, Zach Burden in world champion legs. He drew um, Cody Main hunting. Huh. I think it was – who was hunting that time? Was it, it wasn't Captain America. Um, gosh, he had won the he'd won the Nationals with Cody Main. Anyways, he drew a stiff cast, and he's, I think, 10 at the time. Right. 
and we unsnapped those dogs in the middle of a cut bean field. And before that brass snap got closed, he struck his dog. <laughs> <laughs> No. <laughs> he, he looked at him. He goes, I'm getting that hunter strike. I'm like, oh my gosh. And she carried it the whole way. I don't know how she did it. I don't know why they didn't minus him because he was a kid. I don't know. But they were all laughing. Yeah. And he had the biggest grin on his face just carrying that hunter strike the whole night. Oh, he, had a, he had a plan from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome, yeah. Man. Gosh. I mean, he had to have had that prefabricated in his head, but it was funny. So, yeah, like you said, I mean, I do get enjoyment from that. Yeah, and, awesome. and I wish we had a dog for him to hunt right now. She, that dog, she's done got old and it's she, she's just not in good health. So, he doesn't have anything to hunt right now. I'm trying to train a pup. So, I'm, I'm wanting to find something to get back in his hands, to get him back in these hunts because, I mean, he loves it. We just don't have a dog for him right now, but we're working on that. Right. The Houndsman XP podcast is fueled by Joy Dog Food. Joy Dog Food has a rich tradition of supporting the Houndsman of America. Founded in 1945, Joy is proud of its history and the relationship it has built with the American Houndsman. And in 76 years, there's never been a recall. Made with 100% American-made high-quality ingredients, Joy Dog Food has one of the highest calorie-dense formulas on the market. For 76 years, this Made in America product has kept hunting dogs in the field day after day, season after season. And when we say Made in America, Joy has a long track record of fighting for American freedoms by being on the front lines against the animal rights movement and their extremist tactics. Joy will fuel your hounds and fight for your freedoms, fueled by Joy. All right, so you made it to the top six of the TOC this year. That's you know, one of the top two biggest hunts in UKC. Then you turn right. around and you go to the top 100 of the UKC world this year. Right. Run me through I that. Him before I, I finished him to, I finally put him, I've been working for a year to put him in the hall of fame in UKC. Okay. Which I, I'm everybody, I've heard people talk about it and I was like, well, you know, it ain't but a few. And by the time I was like a grand night two or whatever else, I was like, it can't be that many more. It's a and lot. I'm like, well, God, I never thought I was going to reach the end of that finish line. I was like, good God, could these 50 wins ever come? 50. I mean, that's <laughs> 50 wins. That's a lot. I mean, I, and I get it. Some people say, oh, they're just local UKC hunts. That's still 50 entries. That's 50 times you entered the woods, and I guarantee you didn't win all 50 of them. That's what I was about to say. That didn't count the, count the many times you lost either. Yeah, I mean, if you just if you won every single one of those hunts at 30 bucks a piece, that's $1,500. In entry fees, trying to make Hall of Fame. Right. Yeah. It's, it's not easy. It wasn't. It's the longest drawn out process of a hunt. But when I finally hit it, I was like, well, that's, you know, I may never do this again with another dog, but I did it with this one. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So but, you made him Hall of Fame, then you made a run at the world. Let's talk about it. Where'd you go for zones? I went to uh, uh, Habersham, Georgia. Which is it's not too terribly far from the house, kind of mountainous and everything. But it was a, I think it was a zone six of, of the world. And it's where I went to, and um, I got in that first night. Which it, it's kind of a funny story. I drew one of my buddies named Jason Roberts. He hunts a dog named Quinn, and he and I, I drew each other on the first night. And we were always both of us competitive or whatever. And um, I'm winning the hunt with two hundred plus. There's nothing else close to me too much. So my dog gets treated like six minutes, seven minutes to go in the hunt. And Jason's judging. And we get out there and he's like, yada, yada, yada. He says, preacher's treat. And I said, no. I said, you. and I, at the time, for some reason, I was thinking there was like four minutes left in the hunt. I was like, Stay, stationary can't catch me anyway. And he's like, actually, it can. It just started. <laughs> so he was doing a good <laughs> And I looked down at my watch. I saw it. I was like, oh, my size tree preacher. And went in there. And he had another cooch. So I, I think I put me at um, 225, 325, three, uh, 350. Yeah. So I had 350. And I'm, I'll am i tell him every day. I was like, dude, you did the best thing in the world for me by making me trip by putting the stationary on me. Because without then, I wouldn't have got in because I lost that second round. Right. I mean, they took that second round of the zones. They took us up to the mountains and they were dropping us on four. Or the guy that, 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 guide through the slip through the hole the guide 
was dropping us on like four acre tracks of land on a bucket. <laughs> bucket <laughs> bumping. It was Doing a little bucket yes, bumping. It was, it was horrible. It was horrible. <laughs> and so I lost that night and everything. But the 350 was the cutoff that got me through. And so I got made up there on a one cast win, which yeah. I mean, I, most of the time on the, going through zones, hunting the world or the tournament temps, I always double up, you know, that, that just makes every, makes you feel good when you double up and get up. But that was a single night win. That's what got me through on that one. Yeah. So you, that gets you into the top 100. Then we all convene over in Mount Gilead, Ohio. Were right. you, were you concerned going like the terrain differences from where you hunt at home to, you know, uh, going North? Not really, not really, and and I and the only reason I say that is I knew how he had adapted to hunting in Dyersburg. I knew how he adapts to hunting out on the White River, and I knew how he had adapted to hunting in Indiana. Both times I had been up there hunting, and um, I was like, well, he'll be okay. He knows how to skirt these bean fields. Skirt. I thought he knew how to skirt these bean fields, <laughs> and I was like, he does pretty good on patch woods. And um, I, I wasn't concerned about it. I was just more more concerned. I wasn't too concerned about and being up there because he had been up to indiana twice he'd been to the white river a few times he had been out to dyersburg tennessee on the west west side of tennessee and i knew how he handled patch woods and i kind of like around the house i use the lake as a buffer right and so he hunts the edge of the lake kind of like he does a bean field try to run around the edge of it and um i knew if i could just get on coons that he would do good if he felt like doing good <laughs> and right. um i got up there and he started he started looking good but um the first night of the, on the first draw out, I draw my buddy I was telling you about that puts a stationary on me. So you drew him in the I zones? You drew him in the zones yeah. and the top 100. And the top 100 the first <laughs> night I draw him. <laughs> Which, I mean, this is the second, hey, this is the second year in a row. Last year in Dyersburg, the dude I was splitting a hotel room with from Curtis Todd from down in South Georgia, hunts a dog named Hello Darling, English dog. He and I were splitting a hotel room. We were standing by each other in line talking. We both reach in the box and draw the same cast out. So oh, both, no. <laughs> this is the second year in a row that's just happened. I was like, this is something's up with it. <laughs> no, it wasn't. It was just luck of the draw. And um, so he and I draw it together. We had a, we had an awesome hunt. I mean, there, there wasn't a single easy cast I had all week. I right. mean, it was both of them. All of them came down to were nail biters. So. Yeah, and, and it, that's to be expected. You know, it's the top 100 of the world hunt. That's yeah. where, you know, the cream of the crop, the best of the best, that's where everybody's at. So right. you get through, you make it to the top, what is it, 27? Yeah. Okay, let's let's go to that hunt. What what got you through to the top nine? How did how'd that cast go for the top 27? Ooh. Ooh. Uh, the top 27, I drew out on early round with the best, absolute most best female I've ever hunted with in my life, probably best. And if it wasn't for him catching a bad break and taking a minus on striking tree, I wouldn't have got through. And that's Eric Emery's dog in Little Lamb. I had her and I had her in my top five pickums because I have seen that dog do some work. Buddy, I'm gonna tell you something. That's, that's it's the only difference. I took a 125 tree minus, and he took a striking tree minus over there because she was treated up a stub and uh, you know, just a little mess. And it was a horrible break for him. That's the only way I got through because after that. I, we all got struck in. His, she popped the coon up. He recut her, and she went out through the edge of a field and fell off into the woods and traded coon. Well, mine was trailing the coon and brought the track up through there, and she had just cut the track off that mine was trailing. <laughs> and so mine come in and, and cut and just trailed right up to her tree, like after the tree was over. So I took 75 more minus right there. Right. And then on the, when we recut them off that tree, mine didn't go probably 70 yards and treat again, and he had a coon. So that put us both at 125 plus and I had a circle tree and he had, I had a circle tree it was the only thing it split us. Anyways, we recut our dogs. Both of us for the last 15 minutes, we're stuck at 125 plus both of our dogs were in opposite directions struck and they end up both getting treed within two minutes of the hunt being over Oh, and both having cones. Yeah. And, uh, and all the way, you know, we both had 125 plus, but I went off of the tiebreaker because of the circle tree. Right. And, and it takes those, you know, it takes those licks to get through because, uh, you know, I went through the top 100 and I got beat. I got put out the first night. Um, old Randy Lawson Jr., he he thumped me with Thumper. 
Right. I mean, you know, Wheels, he looked good. He treed two coons, uh, but Thumper treed four. And right. he deserved to win 100%. Right. But, you know, you go right. back you go back to the Airbnb, and you're sitting there looking through the scores, and like, well, by golly, 80% of these casts, it only took one, maybe two coons to get in. Like, right. man, if I, would, if I would, wouldn't have drawn the cast I drew, then I'd be in. That, but that's the luck that's of the exactly draw, right. man. You know, it's the, the luck of the draw. Of the draw. Yeah. Yep. So, okay. So, and, um, so you're in. Top nine. Yep. I'm, I'm at top nine. Top nine. And we're getting ready to go out to, for another two hours. This is late round. <laughs> so, yeah, this is a late round. And I drew <laughs> Stefan Lab with Cash App and Scott Engel with um, that Rodeo Jack dog his. And so that I had a stack cat a cast. I mean that's so I heard through a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend that that cast got interesting. <laughs> it, was, it was a long night. <laughs> yeah, I I heard that it would have been a cast to be a fly on the wall. It was it was it was good. It was it was fun. But um, probably the luckiest cast of my life. My dog looked—he looked amazing on that leg. But like I said, that was luck. That was one of those. But you know, you get good breaks, you get bad breaks. That was one of the best breaks I've ever had as far as competition hunting goes. And it couldn't have came at a better time, so because it got me in a final three. Let's but talk about it. What what break was, did you take? How did you get lucky? What got you in? Well, we turn loose, and um, I get or Engel's dog gets struck for a hundred. I get struck second. And the cash app dog looks behind us and goes behind us across the road over here. Well, Engel's dog's barreling to the right going out through there. Well, mine just goes over there 80 yards and locks down tree 100 yards. And so I tree him. We go in there. Engel trees his dog. And then he moves. And then he trees him again. So he takes 125 minus right there. And I go in there and Preacher's got a coon. So I bust him up. He's sitting at 200 plus. I recut him. And we're going to Engle. Go in there to Engle's dog. He's got a cone. He recuts him. Well, by that time, um, Cash App had went behind us and got around some houses and got in a chain link fence in someone's backyard. So, long story short, and my dog, he's trailing, cuts across the bean field and gets in a tree line. Is uh, Oh, my bad. Can you hear me now? Yeah. And um, he, he cuts across the bean field and gets in this line of woods and he's locating down there and um stefan's worried about you know his dog and i said i said i don't you know it, he's talking to the judge and i ain't worried about that so we call time out for long story short we call time out because his dog's in danger obviously and um i go in there to preacher everybody goes to catch the dog ingle goes in there to his dog i go in there preacher he's got another coon but it was during timeout stefan goes in there to his dog gets his dog out of the chain link fence come back there's a question we go back we come back out hunting. Long, st- long story short, we come back out hunting. We turn loose again. Same suit. Jack gets struck. I get struck. Enos gets struck. Enos goes, or that, he calls that dog Cash Up Dog Enos. Right. Cat, at cash Up gets struck and goes around through there in trees. Mine takes another track around the right hand side, comes around and gets treed about 60 yards away from him. Um, Rodeo, the jack dog, he's going around the edge, trailing out, almost out of here. And so we start tightening up and we get in there. Both of them, mine and Stefan's dogs got coons. We recut them. And my dog goes in through there. She gets struck. His dog gets struck. And we tighten the gap up. And that kind of finished off about that time. Preacher trees again. The judge puts the stationary on me. We go in there just to go with Preacher. He's got another coon. I recut him with 10 minutes left to go in the hunt. And at five minutes, he falls trees and has another coon that I strike him and didn't treat him on because, you know, it was less than that. So, right. And, and it, it, it was, it was, it was a great hunt. Great guys. Just, just some of the fun stuff that comes along with competition hunts, you know? <laughs> oh, <laughs> didn't man. Didn't do with me. I was just sitting back. I, you know? <laughs> well, so, so that's kind of what I heard, you know, and, and, you know, being very honest and just transparent with the listeners here, like that's one reason that I, I even got you on this podcast is, you know, you and I have never talked today before today. This is our first time meeting, right. but right. I was pulling for you on, you know, the final three, because I've watched you and preacher the last couple of years and the way that you just 
handle yourself in these situations and the way that you talk about your dog and the way that you, you know, talked on the camera at TOC is like, I was like, this guy has his life together. I mean, he had, oh, yeah. seems like, you know, it seems like it would take the world coming to an end to get you fired up. And I might be wrong, but it seems like you're just a pretty Dude, chill I've, guy. I've, I've, you know, the way, and that's what people get, people get irritated in these hunts and everything. And I used to let them get to me, but I've been in too many situations in my life that are, or what I consider important and worth getting, <laughs> getting in stressed over. Uh, coon hunting is what I do for fun. It's 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 not going to come that way. Yeah. As long as I I'm not getting shot at and I'm not getting in firefights every single day, I'm doing just fine. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I'm you not know. getting blown up every day. I'm I'm doing just fine. Just coon hunting. Yeah. And you've been in them situations, you know, just with your past and you know being in the military and and you know from the Deep and Lonely crew and Houndsman XP. We thank you for that. Uh, but uh, like. It's just, it's crazy. People get worked up and I'm one of them. I won't lie. I mean, I, I, I'm a lot better now than I was five years ago, but I, I, am st- too. I still get a little tweaked sometimes when people start pulling some funny stuff and some shady stuff. I, I'll get tweaked. I did too. I got tweaked on the second night of the zones real bad. So don't, don't, I mean, I just, but sometimes, sometimes it's okay. You can sit back and just let it go. And sometimes it, you, you have to get a little edgy to defend what you, you know? Yeah. I let your dog, someone, anyone's dog can beat me all night long and I'll shake their hand and be so happy and jump up and down and help them out and everything like that. But don't, don't ever try to let that, let your pencil whip me. You know what I'm saying? Don't, right. don't. Yeah. Some don't people try to keep that pencil sharpener in their front left pocket. Right. And, and if you don't know what you got going on, I mean, you know, people who are just getting into this from the very beginning and they're new to the sport of competition hunting, you know, there's there's the horror stories, but I don't think it's that bad. As long as you know, no. as long as you have a general understanding of the rules, you can combat most things that are going to happen in a hunt and stand well, up like for I yourself. Well, like I tell everybody, like I tell if there, if there's a problem, just say question it and go on about the hunt. There's not, and like I tell anytime I judge, question it. I don't want to hear anything else out of it. You know, just put a question on it. And let's go on about the hunt. And we'll deal with it later. There right. doesn't need to be any arguing. There shouldn't be any arguing. Right. Arguing. We'll do that at the panel or at the, you know, what I'm saying, whatever we need to do there after the hunt. But for right now, let's just hunt and have a good time. And 90% of the time, if you just put a question on it and go on by the end of the hunt, it's all, everything's died down. And most people are just cool, calm and collective by then. Right. Yeah. You know, there shouldn't be any arguing because I try to take my son along with me. And that's, that, that's, that's what angers me. When someone's got a kid on the cast and someone starts cussing or running their mouth during a cast, or if they ever do that, that's when I get angry. And that's, that's when I fly off the deep end. Because that'll ruin a kid. You know, kids don't need to be, they're not going to have any interest in this kind of stuff. If they, every time they go, there's more or three and you know, on the cast. Right. Yeah. You, you've got to, you know, we got to conduct ourselves better as a whole um, in the competition world. And, and myself included, you know, like I said, I mean, I can get tweaked, but I, I do feel like the majority of us that are hunting in the, I don't say the finals or the bigger hunts, but you get to the world and there's a lot less crap, you know? Oh my God. Yes. That, that, that final three is probably the, the best cast I've ever been on in my life. Yeah. So, okay. So you made it to the final three. You're excited at that point. You've already made right. it to the top six of the ter- tournament champions. Now you're in the final three of the world. How are you feeling? Are, are you nervous? Are the nerves getting to you? Because you had a whole oh, night. You yeah. had a whole night to sleep on I, it. Oh yeah. I, I, well, I slept great because we got home. I walked. I laid down in my bed after I got my dog out and got him fed and watered. I got. I laid down at about eight thirty in the morning. Whew. And I had to be back up. <laughs> and so I slept like a rock. Yeah, and then I woke up, and of course, oh man, yes, I, I, I was very nervous. But I looked at it like this, you know. My dog gave me the heart he needed to be to be where we were. He had busted and showed me everything I could. I couldn't, you know, I was proud of him. Whether first, second, or third, I didn't care. I knew who I was in the finals with, one of my good friends and the nerd dogs, and I was just happy to be there. And you know, that was probably the best, absolute best cast I've ever been on in my life. Really? We joked we joked and laughed and had the best time for the whole hunt. Yeah, I mean I, I sat mean, there and, and I watched it online, you know, at the uh the play by play that UKC put on and I mean that in my idea or in my opinion, excuse me, is like one of the best things going for the sport right now. 
I don't, right, have right, you have right. you went back and rewatched it? Like, have you just taken time to sit down no, and rewatch I it? I you need to. Uh-huh. You need to because uh-huh. they did a really really good job of commentating the event and switching back and forth between you guys in the woods and you know Stretch and um, Jamie Estep and Alan right. and um, Steve Burkholder. You know they did a, just right. such a good job of. Uh, bringing up your guys' pedigrees, like all y'all dogs' pedigrees were brought up on the screen, right. and and they just that UKC did a really good job, and I'm gonna tip my hat to them because, you know, they put a lot of time and a lot of effort into making this a professional event, and they did a good and that's what, job. It makes, and it makes people want to watch it. It makes people sit there and watch it, like and, you know. And that's what I, I love PKC. I just I have the worst luck as far as hunting PKC because most of the time, anytime there's a PKC event, for some reason it falls on the weekends. I've got my son. And, you know, on those weekends that I've got my son, if Kaysen says, Dad, I want to paint the barn purple, we're going to get purple paint. Right. I mean, if he wants to go coon hunt, we go coon hunt. Whatever he wants to do, we do. And a lot of times it's not, you know, going way off to a coon hunt you know, that he wants to do. And that's fine by me. I don't mind that a bit. But um, but the way UKC does it and the way they let, to let the, the people that, you know, on Facebook or social media watch it and interact and they kind of – get a feel for how everything works in the competitive world. I think it's good for business and it's yeah. what we need to keep the sport going. Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, mean, most that like you, there are people that I've talked to who, um, you know, they've never really been involved in competition hunting, but they, they watched that, uh, little live deal and you know, it breaks it down for them. They understand it a little more. It gives, it gives our sport some exposure. So, right. Yeah, it's good for it. So, you finished third in in the world. What I did. what's next? What's next? The Houndsman XP Podcast Network is powered by Cajun Lights. All of your lighting needs for hunting can be taken care of at Cajun Lights. They have three models of cap lights. I'm gonna run through them real quick. You've got the Rogaru, which is their high-end light. If you're a competition hunter and you gotta find that coon up in a tree. And it's all riding on finding that coon. You'll want the Rogaroo on your head. Next is the Bayou. That's a pretty standard light, but it's got packed with features. It's got multiple colors. It's got walking lights. It's got the red, the green, the amber. It's all built in right into that light. And then you have one of my personal favorites, the Micro Gator. The Micro Gator is an ultra lightweight cap light. It's got all the features of a white light, red, green, and amber. I've used this light for everything from finding bear tracks early in the morning to coon hunting at night to working on plumbing in the house, changing tires on the side of the road. My truck doesn't leave the driveway without a Cajun light in it. And that light is the Micro Gator. Every Cajun light is durable, made from the highest quality components, and it is backed by Cajun's top rated customer service. Check out Cajun Lights. You can go to our website at houndsmanxp.com. Go to our sponsors page. Hit that link. It'll take you right to Cajun Lights. Check them out. They got a lot of stuff to offer over at Cajun Lights. Well, I'm going to hunt the Grand American this year, which is something I've never hunted, even though it's in my home state. (laughs) I'm going to hunt the Winter Classic. Go back. Hold up. Hold the phone. I'm from Indiana, and I've hunted the Grand American multiple times. I always hunted the P, the the PKC hunt that they have down in St. George, the pro hunt that they generally have all week. Then at the same time, I've always hunted it. But this is the first year I told my buddy, I was like, I'm hunting the Grand American. I'm hunting the Grand American. I'm hunting the, the Winter Classic. I've never hunted either one of those. I'm going to hunt them. And um, then we'll roll, go right into the tournament. This will probably be the last year that I, I really hunt him a whole lot because I've got a three-and-a-half-month-old pup off of him. And I absolutely love this pup. <laughs> I mean, he's three and a half months old. He's already treeing squirrels and running deer. Yeah. And so he's got a he's he's got a bright future ahead of him. Yeah. So and, so how um, old's preacher I'm, then? How old he's is six? He? He's six. Okay. Six. Yeah. He's still got he, man. He's still got some go to him. That's why I got one more year, and then I'm probably gonna stud him. And you know, so right. I'm gonna try to I'm gonna finish try to finish him out to a gold champion in PKC this year, or not next year, and then do the tournament of champions one more time and maybe the world one more time and i'll just be strictly studying him and hopefully by the, that time going into the fall 
I'll have me something for the spring super stakes getting ready to hunt, you know, on the sophomore super stakes. Yeah, that's right. That's right. But now I will say, you know, the Grand American, the Winter Classic, those are both good hunts. I like them from my point of view because, um, you know, it's the dead of winter for us up here in Indiana. We got snow and ice on the ground. And I can go, oh, down, yeah. I can go down south for a little bit and, and get away from the harshness right. of, the, of the wind. Now, don't get me wrong. I do not like summer. I don't like being hot. But when there's snow and ice on the ground, it gets a little tough to tree coon. So it is nice oh, to go down horrible. south and mild it out just a little bit. Um, and right, they're, they're right. good events to hunt. I'm, I've had some success in both of them. I really like those hunts. So it's good. I hope to see you down uh, there. I, love, I mean, I go down to it every year, but this is the first year I've really hunted. So yeah. I'm yeah. going to hunt. Yeah. The vendors down there, for anybody who's listening that hasn't been down to Grand American, that is a crazy event for vendors. It's like people come out of the woodwork. Oh yeah, oh yeah, it's huge. It's you, huge. You've got. I had. I hunt. Go ahead. Do what now? I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. No, I was just gonna say you've just got all kinds of people from different walks of life there. You've got coon hunters and bear hunters and deer dog runners, deer hunters. And, and hog yeah. runners and everybody that runs a hound beaglers. I mean, you've got right. everybody and their brother showing up down there. Right, and he, and he, it's awesome because that's one of the, I I can remember like when I was younger, and there used to be back when. You know how the stud, like the stud fee and the stud barn and all that stuff, it's kind of fell off the map. You know, you used to in the back of a Coonhound Bloodland magazine, that's all you've seen is the big stud dogs. And you used to could go down to the Grand American, walk through that stud barn and see all these banners, of these main top stud dogs. And that's the ones you saw. You don't really see a whole lot of that no more. But what you do see is a lot of puppies. You see a lot of people that are getting connections, like with their local vendors, and you see a good way to get puppies out of them now. You don't really see a whole lot of stud dogs down there anymore. You know what app I use on my phone more than any other app besides the podcast app to listen to this here podcast? I use Onyx. Onyx Maps is the most comprehensive mapping system for hunters on the market today. I use it all the time. When I was in New Mexico, I was looking at 40,000 acres of ranch that I needed to learn. I flip open Onyx and just start studying, studying the map. When I'm riding trails, I put the tracking app on. It helps me get around in strange country. I could mark water sources, food sources, bear sign, just all kinds of options within Onyx. You need to check out Onyx Maps by going to houndsmanxp.com. Click on the link on our sponsor page. You'll go right to Onyx Maps, and when you check out, enter the code HXP20, and you will get 20% off of your order. Know where you stand with Onyx. Well, see, that, that's one thing that I never did get to experience, and I've heard all about it, is like that that stud row you know i've heard right. that at autumn oaks back in the day they'd have a whole barn set up where you had your big banners and your dog you know staked out in front of them on some fresh chips and cleaned up right. shined up you know the the dog owners standing there and you could just go through and, and look at all these dogs and i want them to bring that back i don't know how you it, do it be awesome. because there's so many people at autumn oaks who you know all the, the dogs are there it's not like the stud dogs aren't there they are they're just right. spread out at their own camps or wherever, you know, wherever they want to be. I think it'd be so neat to get them centralized again where you can go and, okay, I want to look at, let's take Kevin Cable. I want to look at big money. I want to look at breaking the bank. And I want to look at break, you know. Right. Uh, or mo money in the bank and breaking the bank. I want to look at all three of those right. dogs. Side by side, right. because, you know, they're all from a lineage. You got granddaddy, daddy, and son now. And right. then I want to see. And I want to see how they, I want to see them in person and watch how they progress and just be able to talk to the guys to know that what I'm going to get as a, you see that. And that's, I love technology, but I think social media and everything like that is t taking that away yeah. from a lot of it. Yeah. I want, know? I want to see, you know, Bertel Davis and Frogger, and I want to see Kurt Aaron and Whitey. And, right. you know, just all these guys with these stud dogs, you know, Justin Davenport with Bushwhacker, him and Tyler Sturry, and, and these dogs right. that are J.R. Gray, Willie. I mean, you can go on and on and on, you know, right. but I want to have them in a line where I can sit there and and just, I don't know, 
you know, feel over the dogs. I want to see, you know, are they confirmationally sound? We know what they, they've won. I mean, that's on the banners. But to be able to put your hands on the dogs and to look at them and to talk to the owners and get a feel for them and, see, and just, like you said, with, with the, the money dogs, you've got a lineage there. So you can see how do they hold up over time. I think that just right. be really good for the, you know, the people who are interested in, in looking for those stud dogs, to put them back in a central no, location. I 100% I agree, man. Like me and my friend Mark Sandiford, he and I were talking about it one time, and, and we were talking about And I was like, what killed the stud dog days? And he's like, he was telling me, he's like, well, he said, I think that a lot of times we said when, when gas supply prices rose up really high, you know, that one year where people couldn't afford to drive that, you know, really to drive to have a dog bred or whatever else, he said, people just started going right up the road and breeding to the local coon dog that was around an area and people started realizing they could have pups that would start and he said that kind of was a decline to the stud dog world and i think between that and social media and you know it's just you don't you don't see a whole lot of stud dog like advertisements like yeah. you used to it's like people like, well here's my dog if you want to breed to it fine <laughs> it, it, exactly and i do think that's a, that's a legit you know point because um you know i got a buddy here that hunts pretty local to where i live now in northern indiana and and he wanted to breed to Wyatt Monin's hawk dog, and right. I I mean I, I that dog. I made the comment. I said, "Why would you do that? He's over in Iowa, you know." And he's like, "Well, I mean, that's the dog I want to breed to, so I'm going to drive." And I was like, "Man, like that's a long way because just the way that I have started coon hunting, you know, I've only been doing this for almost nine years now, which is a relatively short time compared to a lot of people. Um, right. But I didn't grow up." hunting these coon dogs and going to these events and seeing how it was done. So I'm not, I didn't grow up with these people driving, you know, I'm going to take a weekend to go breed my dog. You know, everything that I've seen has just been pretty local. Yeah. I'll drive three, four or five hours, you know, to go, yeah, breed, to go breed that dog. And come back home. Right. Right. Exactly. So it is interesting. And I enjoy learning about that part of the sport that I missed out on and, you know, picking people's brains. And cause sometimes I think that maybe the old days were simpler. They were, I don't know, better. But, genuine i can't say better because i didn't experience them and i kind of like what i got going now so i can't say better but i want to say genuine um you know just well and it, and it's like i was riding it was really my first time in you know the, the world hunt that i was ever exposed to like amish country up there and through there oh boy and you I were in driving, for a treat weren't you oh it was amazing i was driving i was like you know these people you know everything's just so much simpler and nicer and I, it's kind of like coon dogs you know back back then everything was like a lot more simpler and nicer yeah yeah uh, people who haven't you know been exposed to that it is a culture shock i mean now there's a there's a huge amish community up here where i live now so it, it to me it's just second nature you know i drive through it about every other day um but for people who haven't experienced that it's a different way of life those guys know how to hunt too Mike Nisley has a bad dog. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I met him and Jeremiah, and those two of the absolutely two of the nicest, best guys I've ever met in my life was Mike Nisley and Jeremiah Nisley. So. Yeah. Yeah. And they're from up here just north of me here in northern Indiana. Really? Yep. Um, I haven't hunted with them yet. I, I'm planning on trying to get a hold of them uh, and go hunting because I heard that's a pretty nice dog they're packing around. I'd like to see Ooh. him go. He's, and, he, and he don't miss. <laughs> he don't miss. Right. So, so let's just, you know, talk here a little bit about preacher. You're going to, you're going to put him up here in the, after the next year or so, and you're going to hunt this little pup that's off of him. Right. The pup that's off of him. What is, what did you breed preacher to? I guess is what I'm trying to ask. That was a long way around it. All right. So I bred preacher to his half sister and his half sister is off. She goes off that Mojo Mason and she's off Sambo as well. She's an all-natural female. The guy treated a bunch of coons up here on the mountain her first year. And the guy don't competition. He's a good friend of mine named Mike Ramey. He does not competition hunt. But he knows he's got a lot of history of knowing what a good dog is. And he's had plenty of good ones. And he's a dog man as far as training the dogs. So he and I have talked for a couple of years about making that cross. And we finally made it happen and everything like that. And we plug it on. You know, to, so we line cross them. So they're we bred three quarter and a quarter to three quarter and a quarter, and we got three quarter and a quarter, so to speak. So the, are they still and, considered uh, crossbreds? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There wasn't enough outcross there to bring it back to full. No, I'd have to breed. I'd have to breed this one of the pups or preacher to a female walker one more time, then I could register them as walkers. Gotcha. Gotcha. 
Right. Are you concerned about but, having uh, Sambo on top and bottom? Are you concerned about being that tight? No, because I've still got the quarter of blue tick on both sides to throw it as an outlier. And I mean, from what we from these pups and how they are, that is the most amazing. It's the smartest litter of pups I've ever seen in my life. I mean, they are absolutely. I mean, from the time they were born, they 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 just want to be in the woods. And I mean, like out that pup of mine, he's three and a half months old, and he'll be four or five hundred yards away from me at all times, and I have to go run him down because he's running deer every day. Right. And, I mean, it's 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 the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, so we had Wes Hamilton on here a couple, well, I guess it was the last podcast we did. Anyways, you know, he was a big proponent for the crossbred. You know, he said he thought he saw some health benefits and some, you know, different traits from the different breeds. That's why I hunt them. That's why I hunt them. I can remember, like, deer and bear dogs. Like, there's no, we never had purebred bear dogs. It was always cross with this, cross with that, cross with this. And I, I know some of those guys up in the mountains of North Carolina, those mountain men that bear hunts. Some of those dogs have went their whole lives and never been wormed. They had went their whole lives on the cheapest dog feed you could buy. And they were the healthiest horses and they lived to be 14 and 15 years old, still hunting. Right. There's something to be said about crossbreeding dogs and how healthy they can stay. Like you don't have sore footedness, thyroid's not an issue. You know, you don't have any of those issues. And I'm, I'll probably be honest, unless it's a, a few good cross. I'll probably never hunt another purebred dog again. Really, so to speak. You're that yeah. big of a believer in it. I love it. I'm touch Sambo. Sambo is 11 years old, and he's more than 90 percent of people want to handle on any given night at 11 years old. Uh, he's a bad dude. He took it. The guy took him last night. Treat they treat two coons with him. Really, at 11 years old. That's yes. impressive. You know, and, and that's what I'm saying. You know, we talked earlier. My boy, I said his dog. She's run down. She's only eight, and she don't get around good. You know, she had, right. she did get, um, limes and she had heartworms whenever we got her. Um, so right. we, we treated all that stuff and God, it took a toll on her, man. She's eight years yep. old and you would think she's 12, just gray in the face. She's sore. You can't hunt her when it's hot. We'll hunt her some this winter. You know, she does a lot better in the cooler right. weather. Um, but yeah, eight years old. And I mean, she's all but broke down. So that's interesting. I'll tell you, I try to, I run preacher on a treadmill about every day and I swim him about every other day. I'll take him up to the river and I'll make him swim 10 laps against the current. And if they just, he, he's got used to it now. I snap him. He goes, swims a circle, swims back. I send him again. He'll make about 10 laps. And I do that every other day. And then I run him five miles a day every morning on a treadmill. And whether we hunt or not, that's just what he does. And I think if you try to maintain them and I, I only type of supplement, I use a hip and joint supplement. Mm-hmm. Well, I Google with the glucosamine in it right. for his for his joints, and um, I it I wish I could say that's a fail proof because I've seen dogs. It's just all depends on the dogs. Like some of them can be seven or eight years old that I've seen, and they'll hold up forever. And some of them you could do the exact same thing, and at seven or eight years old they'll start doing like you do, and then age really taking a toll on them. Right. And so yeah. I w- I wish there was. A- that's one thing that I, you know, I've noticed just watching you and Preacher on Facebook is how much time you spend with that dog. I mean, you two are together right. all day, every day, from what I can tell. Mm-hmm. And I think, no. that, I think that that does, you know, help in in every aspect of it. You know that that dog hunts for you, and yeah. I'm not I'm not saying that I I really like that in a dog 100 percent because I will say I prefer a dog that hunts for themselves rather than one that hunts for I me. Do too. Um, I don't want to have to be the one on the end of the lead every time, because if I have something come up and I can't make it to a hunt and I need to send them with somebody, I need that dog to operate the same with somebody else on the back of the lead. Right. Um, right. So that would be like, I guess maybe the only downfall I've seen, but I mean, just, you know, just manners around the house and traveling and, and knowing the expectations is when you just spend that much time with the dog, you guys are, you're on the same page. Oh yeah. And and it, it shows, you know, the accomplishments you guys have racked up, it shows. Well, that's one of the reasons, like, I always try to stay real cool, calm, and collective and do everything like that is because he, my dog, I know this is going to sound retarded, my dog goes, he feeds off that. Like, if I'm irritated or something like that, I mean, he could he could tell when you're irritated and if I, and he's not going to look his best. Yeah. And, but and, if he knows everything's cool and... Right. I don't think that, you know, that's a invalid statement at all because I've had a couple dogs that... Whatever you are feeling, it trickles right through that lead, right onto that collar around their neck, and they that's, know. That's right. You know, and that's like my fiance like Nikki. She, 
Yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> We're running all over each other here. It's getting late. <laughs> but like I said, my fiance Nikki, she'll catch me sometimes because she hunts with me a lot. And she goes on these right. casts with me a lot. And she'll see me start getting to get worked up. And she's like, dude, chill. She's like, that dog is feeding off of you. Take a deep that's breath exactly or two. Right. And, you know, things go back to where they need to be. So, I, I mean, I this think old, that's a valid this statement. Old, this old man was hunting with me one time. And he was all, you know, old overalls wearing man with a with a cane. And he was seeing me get mad at Preacher several years ago. And he watched me. And I was getting frustrated. And I'd done seen him twice. He was pissing me off. And that man's like, what you doing, son? He said, what you doing ain't helping, so quit doing it. And I just kind of looked at him and everything like that. He said, put him in the box, go someplace else and think about it, and then get him back out and try again. <laughs> and, you know, we did that. We went I remember We went. We went to Waffle House. He got a cup of coffee. We got something to eat. Changed our mood. We went back hunting, and I treated five singles within two hours. I mean, it's, it's, I was like, well, here we go, you know. Yeah. Old man taught me something else. <laughs> and, and most of the time, it's something simple. It ain't like rocket science. It's just like, hey, hit the reset button and chill out. Right, right, right. Yeah. All right, brother man. Well, I mean, I think this has been fantastic. I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down here and, you know, hang out with me for a little bit, especially since we, like, this was just short notice, you know. Um, I just, I really have enjoyed your journey the last, you know, last couple of years, seeing you on Facebook and, and, you know, just reaching out to you, cold call, you know, can we get you on the podcast? Oh, dude, and, I, listen, I, listen, I listen to your podcast all the time, man, and the things you're doing for this sport, I mean, you got hats off to you. I mean, you guys are awesome. Yeah, I mean, well, we appreciate it. The whole team does for sure. You got anything you want to close with here, brother? I'm good, brother. I'm good. We need to get together and do some hunting here soon. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to hit you up when you get down there to uh, Grand American. We might just go Dude, pleasure come down or week, something. Come down, come, come down a week ahead of time. I got a bedrooms you could stay. Bring your fiance. She can stay. And you know, we got plenty of kennels for your dogs. Come down. We'll hunt anytime. Though. Yeah, man. We, we're going to have to we're gonna have to make that happen. And that's one thing that I, I don't want to just say it. I want to do it because I love hunting with internet buddies you know I, and i got Come that on. i don't know if you have tyler sladen on facebook or not um he's been on the so. he's been on the podcast a couple times um with seth and chad he's from out west but he is all about inviting his internet buddies to come hunting and meeting people that are his friends on the internet but he's never met in person he's all about it and i've really tried to adapt that uh way of thinking it's crazy you know social media that's one good thing that i do think it, it's good for is meeting people that otherwise you wouldn't you wouldn't know you know so i want networking i networking do networking in the hunting community absolutely networking's huge i do that every day for work but in the hunting community it's <laughs> great too so I do want to That's take right. you up on that. You know, we're going to find a time somehow, some way to, to go hunting and it's going to be a good time. Good I want day. to see this dog go. I'll be looking forward to it, brother. Right on. All right, guys. Well, once again, we want to, we just want to thank, you know, Mr. Caleb Griffin for joining us. We want to thank him for his service to our country. And I mean that genuinely from the bottom of my heart. Really appreciate you for that, brother. Uh, appreciate all you guys listening to the deep and lonely podcast. We couldn't do it without you guys. You guys, uh, you're what keeps us going. So, if, you, if you've enjoyed it, hop on Patreon. Join us there on Patreon. Uh, we got a lot of good things going over there. You can follow us on our social medias, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, you can join us on our website. We've got merchandise over there, hats, tumblers, the dog box. we got all kinds of things for you guys uh, to interact with us a little bit deeper and just get to know you guys better as, as fellow hunters and houndsmen. And it, It's a good thing we got going. So, Mr. Caleb, thank you again for joining us, brother, man. And I, I've had a great time. Thank you, brother. I enjoyed it, buddy. All right, buddy. Until next time, guys, we'll see you.